Hello, and this is the second in the uh, initial videos for the random number generator uh, videos that accompany my book on random number generators. Um, you'll find in the description below a link to the where you can get that book um, and also um, some of the documents we're going to talk about. Um, so here, instead of looking at pages full of random numbers and discussing how they were generated, we're going to look at the structure of random number generators and the, and the terms we use to describe various parts of those structures. Um, if you look at this, we have the name PRNG, pseudo random number generator, which we've already discussed, as well as CSPRNG, the cryptographically secure version of it. Um, uh, DRBG, deterministic random bit generator, and in this in this field, CSPRNG is the same thing as DRBG. DRBG, deterministic random bit generator, is defined by NIST as part of SP800-90A, which is a specification for DRBGs. Um, PRNG is more or less the same thing. Um, but SP800-90A only describes cryptographically secure ones. So if it's a called DRBG, it's a crypt cryptographically secure PRNG. Um, a PRNG or CSPRNG or DRB DRBG is something that takes a seed value to set its initial state. And then from that initial state, it will generate a uh, a stream of random looking numbers, either cryptographically secure or not, depending on the uh, the algorithm. OK, so the next uh, one we're digging in a little bit in a uh, in a non deterministic random number generator, one which is um, producing numbers that are going to be different every time um, based on some physical process. There are a number of sub blocks you, you need. So the first is the uh, entropy source. And usually I call it an entropy source. That's what people in the in industry ten tend to call it. In NIST documents, it's got two names. It's called a noise source. Um, and it's also called a source of entropy input. Um, why they use two terms, I don't know, but they do. This is both, they're both from NIST. Um, but you get the idea that they are sampling some physical uh, phenomena to uh, which usually results in electrical noise. And then um, that's where the non-deterministic part of the circuitry comes in. It, it creates the unknown uh, source values that ultimately get turned into random numbers. Um, so that's this stage here. Now, if we move on a stage, we get to the digitization stage. Now, again, this is a NIST defined term, but it's really NIST who broke out the definition of the digitization stage from the entropy source. So usually when we create a circuit to produce um, non-deterministic bits, uh, we think of the digitization being um, part of that, right? But uh, NIST broke out the two parts and called the second stage digitization. And the idea here is what's coming out of the, uh, the entropy source is might not be bits. It might be analog values and the digitization stage, stage might be, say, an analog to digital converter, which is sampling those and producing digital values to output to the next stage. So it's the process of converting um, uh, what we have in the entropy source circuit to something that's more compatible for feeding into an algorithm further down the line. Um, and there are various forms of this. You might have multiple ring oscillator entropy sources, and they all need to be uh, smooshed together into create a stream of bits. Uh, you might have um, a uh, an analog bit generating circuit that's way too fast. Um, and so you need to do some under sampling and synchronization to get that data, um, maybe turn it from a serial stream into a parallel stream or something like that. That could be considered a digitization stage. Um, and, and so on. So there are various forms of digitization stage. Its job is to get your bits into a form which can be used downstream. So the next is the entropy extractor. In academic pages, uh, papers, it's usually called an entropy extractor. Uh, I call it an entropy extractor. Um, 
and then the same thing is called a conditioner by NIST and that's in the SP800-90B specification they describe the conditioner and so this is something that takes the um, the, the non-deterministic data that is not full entropy that's coming out of the digitization stage and uh, squishes it down until it is full entropy. Um, it's possible to have an extractor which um, just improves the entropy and you have a chain of them improving the entropy until you get to full entropy. Um, and when we do the video on entropy extractors we'll we'll get to some definitions of what full entropy really means um, uh, because it's practically impossible to get full full entropy uh, and so we have uh, levels of approximation that we call full entropy um, the next are um, the these are agglomerations of things so what somebody would call a true random number generator uh, what NIST call a non-deterministic random bit generator, those are both the same thing, usually. And I say usually because sometimes when people talk about TRNGs, they don't mean a full entropy uh, source of non-deterministic bits. They might just mean a partially entropic source or something else. It's not a well-defined term, but usually people mean, um, mean the same thing. So we have our uh, three things we just talked about, the entropy source, the digitization stage, and the extractor and conditioner. And when you have all those three things together, um, in, put them all in one box, and you can call it an, NR, an NRBG, or you could call it a TRNG. Um, so top, this top line and this bottom line, these are the same thing. One is just a box containing the other three things. Um, and so we will move on to the hybrid RNG. I have not seen any other term used for this. Um, so everyone calls it that. And this is the idea that you have a combination of the non-deterministic part or the non-deterministic non chain, which it forms a TRNG or an NRBG. So these first three stages, and they output full entry B bits, which are used to seed a PRNG or a DRBG um, and then those, um, uh, so what we've got is a deterministic algorithm that is producing random bits based on a seed, but we have a non-deterministic circuit which is producing the seeds, and so the seeds are themselves non-deterministic. So we have a hybrid of the two forms, a deterministic and a non-deterministic system. And this is the common situation in real world random number generators that you would use for security. Um, in a um, non-secure context, maybe for simulations or, or modeling, things like that, um, you would just have the final stage. You would want to know what the seed is because you'd want to be able to recreate um, sequences and there's no goal of security. So hy hybrid RNGs are used for secure um, uh, situations. Uh, outside of secure situations, you usually just use a PRNG. And then the last uh, major units we're looking at here is the online health test, OHT. So uh, I talked a little, about, little bit about this in the previous, um, previous video. So here we have um, the output from the entropy source being digitized into bits and you want to know if that's broken, particularly in a secure um, situation where you're ex expecting the, um, the output of the random number generator to be used for cryptographic pur purposes. Um, there is a, uh, in, in a secure situation like that, you generally need to deal with uh, the problem of the thing breaking or being attacked or breaking because it's being attacked. So it might be attacked by, um, uh, somebody trying to break the cryptographic system. Um, there's been plenty of examples of that, say on payment cards in the in the underground that was using a, a Philips system and somebody um, managed to break the random number generator in that chip and so could clone their own payment cards. Um, so then it's the example of the random number generator is in the hands of the adversary, the person who's trying to ta attack it, and they can do whatever they like to try and make the random number generator fail while having the rest of the system not, not 
realize it's failed. So one of the things you can do there is put in an online health test, which is checking that the thing is working. Um, and what it's checking is that the noise source is working. This, there's, there's other self tests you can do, but this is just che checking that the noise source or the entropy source is working. And so it's looking at the patterns coming out and it is running tests to try and um, establish that the thing is not broken. Or if it is, it raises some sort of alarm um, in the circuit to say, uh, you know, report the error to the user or reset and restart to see if it's going to go away, things like that. So you have various uh, options of what to do based on um, the context you're in. And then lastly, this is a, a grab bag of terms which you need to deal with when you're building random number generators. So BIST stands for built-in self-test. Um, so I talked about the online health test, testing the entropy source. BIST tends to test the rest of the system. So in the case of, say, the one I'm most familiar with in the Intel chips, there's BIST logic. It, text, it tests all the digital logic um, and then it tests the entropy source. Um, so everything is tested. And then while it's running, it continues to periodically test the logic. So it knows when somebody, uh, if somebody's trying to attack it. API, an application programming interface. Um, so you have to serve up your random numbers to somebody. You need to serve up some kind of control to configure the random number generator or, um, or anything else you might choose to do. And you'll present that through an API. That API might be a software interface or it might be a bus interface. So um, if you're hardware, you're typically going to hook it up to a computer bus, um, say PCI or an on-chip bus like a an ARM host bus or an ARM peripheral bus or um, Intel has their own um, internal buses. Um, every every chip has, you know, digital chip has a bus um, a, a, across which different devices can talk to each other. Um, fault injection detection. So there is a, uh, it's a relatively new um, field in um, attacking cryptographic circuits is fault injection. It's not that new, but it's, uh, uh, it's a very active field right now and it's being, uh, it's being improved all the time. And by being improved, I mean people getting better and better at better and better at attacking circuits through a thing called fault injection, where they try to inject a fault into the circuit using say an electrical probe or a, a pulsed RF field or glitching the power supply, various things. And by injecting the fault, you can cause um, some error in the computation going on inside, and that can then be used to um, do a cryptographic attack later. Um, so it is good in any secure random number generator to implement fault injection detection, where you're actively looking out for these kinds of failures. So you have uh, circuits which are detecting glitches, detecting erroneous computations, things like that. And there's a whole art and field to how, how we do fault injection detection. Combiner, so maybe you have multiple entropy sources. You, maybe you want redundancy where some of them can fail, but you carry on. Maybe you want multiple of them because you want the whole thing to go faster. Um, but ultimately you've got to combine these things. And how do you combine them? Well, that's a question for another video because um, there are different things you might want to do in a combiner and different algorithms to use. So we have a combiner. Um, backwards prediction resistance and forwards prediction resistance. These are properties of RNGs uh, or properties of PRNGs or DRBGs. Uh, backwards prediction resistance says if you, uh, an adversary who is looking at the output from the random number generator, if it has backwards prediction resistance, if the adversary learns the state of the random number generator, can they um, predict the previous values that were generated by the random number generator? And if not, that's called backwards prediction resistance. And that's quite easy to, ch to achieve algorithmically. You use one-way functions in the, in the computation st stage. And then once you've learned the current state, it's hard to work back to previous states. Forward prediction resistance is a little harder to achieve. So this says, again, if you have 
um, learned the state, can you um, predict the future state and, uh, and future outputs? And generally the answer is yes, unless you do something about it. And the thing you need to do is introduce more non-deterministic entropic values into the state every time you produce a random number. And then you don't know at the time of learning the state what that future entropy entropic data is going to be, so you can't predict the output. So that's forward, forwards prediction resistance. Um, two types of entropy. We've talked about min entropy, which is the values we usually think about. Um, uh, and there are reasons for that mathematically. Min entropy is the, is the uh, right uh, metric to use for the quality of your random data coming out of an entropy source. But there's also Shannon entropy. And when physicists talk about entropy of a system, in physical systems, they're usually talking about Shannon entropy, and you think you can think of that as the, of the as the weighted average of the entropy in the system. Hill entropy. Um, that's Hill is the uh, initials of the four people who wrote a paper defining Hill entropy. Um, these are um, this is a definition of entropy that says. Uh, entropy is def defined as a function of the computational difficulty of um, learning the state from the RNG. So um, if it is computationally uh, hard for an adver adversary to predict the state of the random number generator or future values or past values, then you'd say it has full Hill entropy. Um, so this is an interesting definition because it's saying um, we're not really talking about non-determinism here. We're talking about effective non-determinism where, because of the ignorance of the adversary, they are unable to compute what the random numbers are, and it's just as good as being full entropy data. Um, so it is entropy as it, as it appears to a computationally bounded adversary. And the last one, which is actually one of a class of objects which we get in extractor theory, which is the theory of entropy extractors, is a disperser. And this is something where uh, in an extractor you might take partially entropic data so it has a non-uniform distribution and we're trying to produce data that has a has full entropy and so a uniform distribution a, di a disperser takes some non-uniform distribution and let's say it's a it's values from a dice but the dice is only returning values from one to five it's not returning the value six it's giving you a uh, it's never returning the value six because it's a broken dice. So you'd roll it many times and you'd get the value to one to five. So the distribution is looking like the probability of a one is one fifth, of a, of a two is a one fifth and so on up to a five. Each has a probability of a fifth, but the um, value of getting a six is zero. So we have a non-uniform distribution. A disperser will take any such non-uniform distribution and, and produce an output that has a distribution where every value has a non-zero probability. It doesn't say it'll be a uniform distribution, but it's creating a distribution which has um, a, uh, it, where every, every possible value can occur. And um, that is usually a component used in extractors. Um, so the, the name, you can see how that's a sensible name. It's saying we're taking this set of values and we're dispersing them across the full range of possible values. Um, and you'll find extractors made from uh, combinations of dispersers and other elements to make a full entropy extractor. So that's all the terms we're looking at here. Um, and we've given a sense for the kind, of way, the kind of ways these various items to which we've given names are hooked up in a normal random number generator. Um, and uh, hopefully that's going to uh, give you a good mental model for the future um, uh, videos. And then the next video is going to be on entropy sources. So we are going to be looking at this stage and we're going to look at the various circuits that appear um, uh, to, to you know, gather entropy from the environment. Uh, thank you and goodbye.